Good morning. Um, first announcement, I got a list of announcements here. Uh, Tommy Pickles could not make it. I have his presentation here. I read it in Albertsons, and uh, I think I could do it. Uh, second one, does any, like those people who have this badge, you know, everyone has this badge, right? Has anyone figured out the fourth clicking on it, like the Morse code that's coming out of it? Uh, that's wrong. It says, welcome to QueerCon. <laughs> The fourth thing, or the third thing that I want to do, and this is really asking you guys a lot, I really want to see if we can get a wave going, because no one's done it yet. So if we could do, like, we could start it from either side. I think this side looks a little ambitious. If we want to try to do the wave, it would be so awesome. Thank you, guys. All right. Good way to start off. All right. Um, this is 802NX Networking. Does anyone know what 802NX Networking is? Can I get a share of hands? All right. That's a good portion of you. So we don't have to do this then. <laughs> Who wants to talk about Jenny McCarthy or something? All right. Uh, if I'm not speaking loud enough at times, just yell. Uh, this is a pretty loose thing. I think we know each other well enough uh, that we can yell at each other. Um, who is Tommy Pickles? Well, did the De DEF CON Cannonball run for like four years uh, until he got a DUI in Las Vegas. It's not that funny. <laughs> uh, 15 years uh, doing computer stuff, uh, MTV, Google, Nature Magazine. And that guy's a media whore. <laughs> If you haven't seen him on TV, uh, you probably don't live in any of the countries that speak English. Okay, what is 802NX and uh, is one of the things we're gonna talk about. Uh, why do we use it? How does it work? What is required? How do you set this up? What problems exist? Can the problems be fixed? And we'll try to answer as many questions as possible. All right. I'm really like dry mouth from last night from, <laughs> yeah. What stays in Vegas stays in Vegas, right? Um, Port-based network access. Basically, 802.1x is a way of securing network access and doing authentication over ports. Um, it's not a wireless spec. A lot of people will confuse 802.1x as being a next generation wireless. It's not. Uh, it's an IEEE spec that was created for uh, wired Ethernet. Uh, it could be used for automatic VLAN assignments, which we'll talk about a little later. And obviously, it could be used to secure access, especially on wireless LANs. Um, wireless example on why we would use such things. Well, if you don't know already, WEP is very insecure. And this is the thing that everyone uses for network access. Uh, they'll use MAC address filtering and all that stuff. It's so easy to break um, wireless with replays and stuff like that. So y you really shouldn't use WEP at all. Um, it also slows down your encryption on your access point just by using um, the encryption on the access point. Um, 802.1x uh, or uh, TKIP, uh, you know, WPA TKIP, um, is not open to replay attacks. Um, so you, that's another reason why you should use better encryption. Um, I could go through a lot of these things and talk about WEP. Uh, it's very useless to really talk about uh, WEP and the man in the van uh, kind of stuff because if I could stay outside your business long enough, I'm going to generate so many IVs that I can actually decrypt your traffic really easy. So it's not even worth uh, even covering WEP. Um, these are all of the tools you can crack uh, wireless with. Um, one of the things that's really funny, if you haven't seen it, and I know it's really hard to copy the tiny URL on the bottom, but there's a really funny video um, where they actually crack a 40-bit WEP off of like a Mac laptop in like, I think it's like seven minutes or something, just by doing replay attacks. Uh, so you could show it to your bosses and say, the wireless is insecure here watch this video and it has a cool like like techno loop in the background so you don't get really bored. Um, 
And also, let me give it uh, like props to like the the Shmoop people because uh, Air Snort is pretty cool, especially since it does work on Windows as well. So if you're gonna run uh, a packet, fil you know, capture and try to crack web, uh, Air Snort's pretty good. Uh, if you want to go like really better than that, um, I'd actually suggest uh, Backtrack. Backtrack's a really cool CD if anyone knows what that is. Uh, it was actually made from Whopper, uh, but they switched to Slacks for the OS, and uh, it's it's you put it in and it's just great cracking CD. All right, uh, wired example. Why would we use 802.1x? Uh, we're gonna want to force unauthorized users into like a guest VLAN. Or, uh, example would be uh, you have a large company and you have conference rooms, and I come in with my little Ranch One bag or you know, Pizza Hut bag, uh, you don't know what's in it, and I'm walking around the office, I could always drop a laptop in the corner and just start capturing packets off your LANs. Um, you're gonna wanna force any unauthorized MAC addresses or things without a supplicant into a guest VLAN, so they only have internet only. Um, the other thing you can do is you can take your wired assets such as like an employee workstation, uh, he works in N, she have a salesperson, and you want to swap those two seats, you don't actually have to call networking to swap those two people and put them in different VLANs. You can automatically do that stuff. All right, um, I already pretty much covered this. Uh, basically, I, I work for a company, uh, AKA Moogle, we'll call it, because I don't want to disclose any information. Uh, some smart people out there. A um, lot of employees, uh, sales, HR, IT departments, the problem is you want to be able to move these departments. You might have like 300 people in a department. You move them from one floor to another, uh, it's really hard to keep VLANs in track. So you might want to do something like um, have all these supplicants authenticate against a, a switch and then you can actually uh, switch them from floor to floor without even dealing with networks. Um, What's required? Uh, anyone have any questions yet so far? Like they don't understand or, you know, they, uh, uh, every OS, this works with everything pretty much. Um, <clears throat> what's required for an 802NX network? Uh, you have to have a decent switch that actually uh, supports 802NX. You can't just buy a Netgear and it's gonna work in an 802NX environment as an authentication switch. Um, you're gonna have to get something more like, uh, you know, like HP or, uh, you know, like a 4000 whatever switch. Um, the access points, a lot of access points out there will support 802.1x, uh, but the, the wireless access points here tend to be a lot less favorable of 802.1x. If you go to like Dublin or something like that, pick up one of those neck ears, they always support 802.1x. So I don't know why other countries are ahead of us uh, on the curve for uh, security, but um, that's the way it goes. Radius, <coughs> this is what you're gonna use to do a lot of your authentication. Um, there's a lot of different radius servers. I recommend free radius, because it says it right in the title, it's free. Um, <coughs> there's funk. Uh, Radius NT and Radius X. Uh, Funk was just acquired by Cisco, I think, about 2003. Juniper, Juniper thank you. Uh, so um, obviously it's a good product. Um, they also make client software. There's a lot of free client software out there. Um, X Supplicant is what you'd use on Linux. Uh, OS X has its own client. Uh, Microsoft has its own client. Um, and you're gonna need a switched environment. 802.1x is heavily dependent on ARPing and MAC addresses. You can't run it in a broadcast network. Um, it's, uh, you can't uh, even run it through multiple switches unless you're authentic, th <coughs> excuse me. I got like really dry mouth. <coughs> uh, blame Hefe for that if anyone you know knows Hefe. Uh, switch environment because you basically have to uh, ensure that that node is that node. All right, how does it work? I'm not gonna read through this whole rigmarole, uh, but basically it's passing authentication credentials to your authentication server. Um, it's, you, 
your switch isn't really doing the authentication. It's the radio server that's doing the authentication. It's only passing the uh, credentials back and forth and then authenticating you on that switch, basically. This is how it kind of looks in a whole diagram, uh, what it's actually doing. Uh, think of the authenticator as your wireless switch. And your radius is obviously, obviously doing your authentication. The supplicant is going to be your, your node. It could be even a, a wired node. It could be a wireless node. It doesn't really matter. And you're going to pass some sort of credentials there, which can be certificates or it can be username and password. It's whatever you decide in your network. And uh, 802.1x can support a multi uh, multiple amount of uh, protocols. This is even taking it one step forward. Um, talking about how you can actually link your uh, LDAP or your AD server uh, to your authentication server to actually extend the uh, authentication. Um, I'll, I'll talk more about uh, how you can actually, uh, you know, tighten up security and uh, use LDAP servers uh, later in the presentation. But um, this is just one, one diagram to show you how everything actually works on different layers. This I don't think you're going to be able to read, unfortunately, because it's so tiny. But um, everything's on the DEF CON CDs. I, I tried to get as much in this slide as possible. But it shows the authentication uh, flowchart when you're actually using um, either a wireless mo node or a wired mode. Um, if you go through one, one side of the, the slide uh, and you're wireless, if you connect to the SSID and you exchange the right TKIP and you're in the radius, boom, you can either, at that point, you're either forbidden or you get uh, the proper VLAN. Um, and same thing on the wired end. You could do the same exact thing. I wish I had some music in the background or something, so it seemed like this conversation flowed a little more. Um, how would you set up 802.1x? The way you would do this is you have to have a switch, uh, some sort of switch that supports 802.1x. You have to have a radius server. Uh, that's very important. And like I said, you could get a free one. Um, you got to configure the secrets for the switch to talk to your radius server. And I would do this through a very secure tunnel because radius, the way it talks, it's not very secure. And you could talk to the Shmoo guys. They have a great presentation on radius insecurities. Um, you want to configure your authentication on your radio server. You could support like MSChap, you can support MSChap v2, you can support LDAP, it doesn't matter. And then you're going to configure the supplicant on the workstation. Um, some of the stuff on the workstation that you can uh, configure is you can configure the supplicant to actually use certificates. Uh, you could do it through TLS. You could actually do it through TTLS and only have the supplicant uh, um, know what certificate you're authenticating against, and then use username, password. Um, there's 8 million ways of running it, probably, but not really 8 million. There's probably 8 million minus 7 million, blah, 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 blah. What problems exist with 802.1x networks? Um, laptop theft is one of them, and I, I'll tell you a funny story about stealing laptops. Um, supplicant configs are in clear text on a lot of these things. And uh, obviously, the Shmoo guys have this presentation on how Radius can be attacked. All right. If the laptop gets stolen, you have all these credentials on the laptop. So one of the things that is a problem is a lot of people don't report laptop theft. And uh, when they don't, uh, I could clone the MAC address. I could actually copy the authentication stuff. I could just take the hard drive usually out of it and put in something else. Um, unless they're doing Mac authentication, um, still cloning a Mac is very trivial. Um, if this happened on a weekend, um, you know, a couple goes to Barbados and they forget their laptop or think they forgot their laptop and I have it, uh, they're not going to call work until Monday morning. And usually security is not going to be there until Monday morning. Uh, so I have all weekend to break into that company. And if they have an Eng VLAN for that laptop, it could be huge. Um, 
Supplicants that have in clear text, X supplicant on Linux is in clear text. Um, OS 10 has a supplicant also, and that's also in clear text. And whenever you put your username and password in this, this is, this is in the clear, and uh, you can get to it through the file system, um, which is true for most Linux and OS 10 stuff. Uh, a lot of stuff is in the clear. Radius can be attacked. Um, funny story, working at uh, Moogle, we'll say. Um, the, you might use a Radius server for more than one authentication. You might be using this for, say, one-time password and also be using it for something like, uh, you know, your 802.1x uh, authentication. Um, if you DOS Radius and cause too many connections because it's kind of limited with the UDP because uh, it serializes connections, um, you can actually take down the Radius server and then uh, you're not going to have any more th authentications on your network. Can this be fixed? Uh, laptops? Yeah, maybe. Um, Supplicant configs? Yeah. Uh, Radius protected from attacks? Sure. And is there more ways of authenticating users to make this more secure? Sure. All right. I didn't write this in the slides because we're, this is just between us, okay? Um, talking about laptop theft, uh, I work for a company called MTV. Um, you might have heard of them. They have a big security booth at the bottom and X amount of floors above them. And I had uh, red hair back then. So uh, I was a target. People said, how can you be a hacker with red hair? They know when you're coming. Well, they also get really used to you coming in and out of the building when you have bright red hair and you talk sports with the guys at the security desk and all that stuff and make them happy. I actually didn't work there for a whole three years and still was coming in and out of that building <laughs> because they thought I worked there still because they're like, oh, that red-headed guy. So uh, things we used to do, though, is we used to dress up as delivery guys for Ranch One and... Uh, carry those bags that keep the food hot because when you go in the building they don't stop you when you come out of that building they never ask to search that bag so we'd have three or four laptops in there just as a proof of concept <laughs> and then uh, we would leave with them um, there's a way of fixing this and uh, I'll talk about it in a second uh, supplicants in the clear text um, Mac OS has file vault. I'm not a Mac OS guy. I don't know a lot of stuff about Mac OS, but one of the things when we were instituting Mac, uh, OS 10 and a lot of, I mean, uh, 802.1x in the companies that had OS 10 in it, uh, we were kind of worried that it was in clear text and if a laptop gets stolen, we don't want the credentials easily off this laptop. So you might be able to use File Vault and encrypt the file system, like just like Microsoft encrypts its file system now, and IBM has a chip on their computer, or Lenovo or whatever has a chip on their computer to do encryption. Uh, you might be able to just encrypt the file system. On Linux is another issue. <clears throat> Linux, you might actually be able to write a shell script to GPG your credentials, and then un-GPG the credentials, and that might be another way so that you're actually putting in a really tight password to unlock your credentials. Um, radius, well, if you set up your networks properly, no one's going to be able to DOS your radius unless they're inside. And if they're inside, you should know who is actually sending out this much traffic. Uh, you could just look at cricket grass and stuff. All right, more ways of authenticating users. Um, this, this turns out to be the best thing ever. Because when you do set up ra or, um, 802.1x in a network, you usually set up the supplicant as a one-time, you know, you enter the password, username and password, and it sticks in there. Because you don't want the CEO of your company sitting there entering something over and over again that's a randomized password because he's going to get very upset at you. So what you do is you actually have it just boom. You like put it in once and never take it out. Problem here is now if I steal your laptop through a Ranch One bag and walk out with the MTV with it, you're, you're pretty much, you left a hole open. 
So you have to like get some other way of authenticating users. One way of doing this is you can actually connect uh, your Captive portal up on your network so they actually go through a web browser just like in any hotel and authenticate that user. And there's ways of doing it through like Active Directory and LDAP, but you could also even go further than that and use cookies or you could do some other way of letting that thing expire so the user has to do it again. And if you're doing it through Active Directory or LDAP, they're going to use a password that they've always used for their email or whatever. So it becomes very easy and said CEO doesn't get mad. And when they don't get mad, you end up keeping your job. All right. That's all I got really much. I, I ran through it because I think this should be more of a discussion and uh, I really got a headache. So um, I wanted to know what questions and what could we go through uh, to really drill this thing down. Go ahead. Oh, oh shoot, see, I w actually went through my slides and I thought I actually had that on my slide. Okay, one of the things that we actually worked with for MTV is uh, we used um, those uh, proximity tags inside the laptop shell. Like if you open up a laptop shell, you actually, on the IBMs, you have a lot of area between the laptop and the uh, actual screen. So you could put a lot of stuff in there. Now, when an employee leaves your office, they go through you know, the Walmart security thing and it'll start beeping on them. And uh, if it beeps on them, they have to actually show ID when they walk out. So it, it just helps determine who is supposed to walk out with a laptop. There's uh, other companies such as uh, um, the New York Mercantile Exchange I just worked for. They won't let laptops leave unless uh, you're authorized to do so. They'll actually take your bag and they'll scan it through a, you know, like one of those x-ray machines and actually see if you have a laptop in your bag. And then if you do, they actually have to uh, get some sort of authorization to, for you to remove the bag. Anyone else? Right over here. True, very true. Um, you can do username authentication from the machine just by doing the machine. The problem is when a user logs onto a machine, they're using their LDAP credentials usually, using username and password. When you bring up the 802.1x client, you don't want to, or the supplicant, you're not gonna want to actually configure that for the same username and password because now you're just making things a little too easy to hack. I know it's a little uh, security through obscurity, but uh, you're gonna want to uh, configure it for something different. You're not gonna want your, your employees to type in something different all the time because that will get them mad. So instead, you create something that can co you can actually lock down to a time-based period of them going through a captive portal, therefore making it a little obscure um, but you can take the Microsoft client and actually make it so that they have to enter uh, a username and password each time. Um, Funk is actually doing their Odyssey client the same way. They're actually making it so you could uh, not keep a password in there. So there's different ways of not doing the machine. You could actually be changing that password as much as you want. But uh, it's a lot easier to authenticate the machine on the network. Um, and then do a captive portal, then actually make the machine uh, just have one factor of authentication like that. Does that answer? Okay. Anyone else? Questions? Over here. Um, in Radius, uh, uh, no, <laughs> no, kidding with you. Um, I believe it was, uh, you had a question about the guest VLAN being, a f um, when it falls back to a default, fall backs to a default VLAN, uh, is that done by the radius server? 
And the question is, yeah, or I mean, the answer is yes. Um, you could actually put VLAN IDs in your radius. So when something authenticates against radius, it actually throws a VLAN like ID as like 101 or 102 or something. And that VLAN will actually um, be configured to your switch, what VLANs are actually thrown up. Um, and if you don't authenticate, you could actually have it throw the guest VLAN uh, from radius or even from the switch at that point. Over here. On the what switch, it'll turn, it'll t on the VoIP switch, it'll turn 802.1x off? Okay, uh, there is, seems to be an issue, he's saying, with uh, Cisco environment. When you're using a Cisco VoIP uh, phone, it'll actually turn off the 802.1x off, off for that environment, for that node though, for that particular node. We'll s see in that, if you're using that, though, it would not get back to a guest network, so I don't think. It, it depends uh, what kind of network you're trying to hop VLANs. Uh, does anyone work for Cisco in this room anyway? If they do, please raise your hand, because I want to talk some shit about Cisco. Um, oh, really? <laughs> Cisco has gone ahead, and Cisco makes a, a radius server also. I didn't include it because uh, they like to go outside the, uh, the, the spectrum, the actual protocol. They actually run UDP over TCP and that's to get more connections. Uh, so I don't use it. Um, the other thing is uh, in a wireless environment, it's, I, it, I just, it, A, it's insecure. Um, B, the, uh, the LWAP stuff is uh, I think a generation behind. Um, I, the Aruba network that we're using for wireless here, even though I think we're getting overloaded, uh, Aruba is awesome. If any of you guys are thinking about doing any s really severe wireless, uh, I'll plug Aruba because Aruba is just friggin' amazing uh, when it comes to uh, uh, next generation authentication. Uh, had a question somewhere? I don't see, oh, sorry. I'm sorry, can you, you know, okay, um, he, the, the, the comment was, um, when you're running VoIP on your network, it's going to be separated from your data network anyway. Um, again, depending on who's configuring your VLAN. Like, uh, I'm not going to bash any network engineers or something like that, but uh, usually you're not going to have... Uh, I, I've never had VoIP in a network either because uh, there was no reason for VoIP. Um, Alexander Graham Bell did a really good job with telephones. Oh. So uh, I will never go to a business go, you got to do what VoIP. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's really confusing. I do VoIP at home. I use Vonage, and uh, I'm not going to give any of you guys my phone number. But uh, the, uh, uh, I, I don't use VoIP in business, so uh, the, those are great comments. And <laughs> if, if I ever have to do VoIP in a business, um, awesome. <laughs> Uh, next question. I don't see any hands. Oh. Uh, the question is getting rid of hubs that might be in a network when you're trying to prepare for Ada 21X. Um, <laughs> it's really hard to tell you, like a lot of engineers love to do the dual machine thing and have their machines and there's a lot of issues with that. Um, so they'll, they'll want their actual switch. Most 
businesses, though, start running like four ports to each desk because they want to run their phone over Cat5 and stuff like that to do uh, VoIP phones. Um, but the only way to do that is actually put switches at desks and stuff like that um, and try to keep switches there. You can actually uh, be really hurt if you actually put broadcast stuff uh, on each desk. Um, your 802.1x will work sometimes only. Like, you know, it'll, it won't work all the time, but if you have the other node come on there, you're gonna see all the traffic and be able to clone that Mac and do a replay attack against the authenticator server to actually steal that tra traffic or hijack it. So um, the best policy is just tight with security. I, I just couldn't even name anything because, you know, it's not something that I, I, I would, I've supported in a network. Over here. A say it again, a remote wipe. No, um, that's why I, I've supported a captive portal because the captive portal, I'm sorry, uh, it, people who didn't hear the question, the question was uh, when the laptop gets stolen, what kind of end, endpoint <coughs> security would we use if the laptop was stolen, uh, like a remote wipe or something? Um, I've never used a remote wipe or even thought about that because by using a captive portal, the, when the laptop is stolen, they would have to authenticate again against the captive portal to get back in. Um, by that time, I should be notified by security or something like that that they actually had a laptop stolen because to get someone's username and password, it, it, it might be trivial in some cases, you know, like, you know, uh, key loggers and stuff like that, but the chances, uh, I don't think, uh, are enough reward for the overhead of trying to work out some remote wipe software for, you know, like wiping out the credentials for 802.1x. Uh, over here. That's true. <coughs> PG, uh, even uh, PGP desktop, I think, actually works. Yeah, you could use PGP desktop to uh, encrypt uh, the software on your laptop so that no one can get to those credentials. Uh, anyone else? Over here. Yeah, um, I, he was talking about the LoJack software for uh, laptops. Um, also, uh, there, it, there is uh, another piece of software. I, it came out a long time ago. I'm not sure if it's still around, and you guys might remember it. If a laptop actually gets stolen, there was one that actually had a, a modem dialer on a, the, the, the boot layer of the disk or something like that. So if ever, ever connected to the internet or something, it would actually dial out and try to locate the laptop. Um, I, d I don't know if you could still use something like that because people don't usually use modems now. And if you do, uh, good going, Alexander Graham Bell. Over here. No. <laughs> I, I, you know, I can imagine in the future if it, if it was that kind of uh, printer. Usually in like a trading environment and stuff like that, I've seen that they, they always resort to a local printer, you know, and local devices that way. They don't use network devices. And if you were going to do an 802.1x for that, um, there might be an actual node kind of thing like a, a switch that you would connect to it or something like a printer sharing switch or something. But I haven't seen anything come out like that. And the the way that you would configure any 802.1x supplicants, I think there's just too many options in the network to actually have a shared device that actually uses 802.1x credentials, you know, because uh, it's a firmware thing, um, I, I, and it's always changing. I mean, who knows when we'll, we'll have uh, MSChap v3, which we should have coming out pretty soon after Vista, and that will be in like 2020 or something. Anyone else? Okay.
True. Um, again, uh, we're, he's talking about the uh, if you hibernate a laptop uh, and you already logged in with 802.1x credentials, uh, you're already logged in. So what stops you from uh, going to another location or you know get back on the network if you steal the laptop? The uh, one problem I see with that is when I hibernate, it asks for a username and password when I unlock my laptop. So obviously, uh, it's going to secure my laptop by default. Um, and that should be set by a help desk department or something as a security policy. The other uh, thing is that's why you would use probably a, a captive portal in your network because, uh, like, for example, one of the companies I worked for had a four-hour captive portal. So after four hours, it would lock you out anyway, and you'd have to reauthenticate through a browser. And now that you're using a username and password in your browser, um, you would actually secure yourself from that laptop being stolen and used on the network again. And over there. Can you say that again? Okay. Um, the comment was the uh, if on a Cisco network, if you actually uh, hibernate, it's going to force uh, you to reauthenticate. If you have link state change, which of course would be in a hibernation, um, it'll ask you to reauthenticate with the the network. Uh, how am I on time? I don't want to keep on. Okay, it's, you have like five minutes, ten minutes, or something. So, get them in when they're hot. Anyone? Anyone? Oh, over here. I hear two people c talking. Uh, the guy here with the hat. <laughs> Any captive portal software, which what? Oh, that I recommend using. No, they, the, the, the captive portal software or the captive portal stuff should come from your switch. Uh, I, maybe uh, I should have talked more about that. Um, your switch is being, doing the, all the authentication for you. Like it's passing authentication back and forth. You're going to want that switch to support a captive portal. And if that vendor doesn't support a captive portal, they should be working on one. And I, I again, I don't want to bash Cisco, but Cisco uh, is really hard to get a captive portal working with it. Um, you can do it off of a server, but now you're adding confusion uh, to your network if, you, uh, if you're not doing all your, or enforcing your authentication from your authenticator, which is going to be your switch. Um, that's the way to do it. Uh, someone else was talking over here when the question, I like, you, I guess it was you over there? Okay, go ahead. Um, again, uh, it depends how you design your network and your firewall controls, whether uh, or not you're going to prevent VLAN hopping. I can't go into uh, the way I'm going to design a network here uh, for VLAN hopping. We could be uh, like here for a while, and I don't have a whiteboard. Uh, anyone else? We've got five more minutes here. there any walls? Any authentication on the switches themselves? Amongst, to actually talk to each other, you're saying? Yeah, is there any authentication between the switches? Um, the switch, it, in the networks I do, the switches don't talk to each other because they're all talking to the radius server for their VLAN controls. The switches, uh, I, I think you're talking about core switches, right? I don't know what switches you're talking about talking to each other. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they uh, they don't though. That's the thing. You're not, <laughs> right, Like yeah, 
Yeah, they uh, they don't uh, actually talk to each other that way. They actually, your your switch is going to be a core switch anyway. The in an 802.1x network, uh, it's got to be a core switch because that's what you're doing authentication through. You don't want other devices uh, basically screwing up your authentication there. So your your switch is actually uh, a core switch. So it doesn't actually talk to any other devices. I think. Uh, Unless I got one more, uh, I'm out of here. All right. Uh, if you need to contact me or Tommy Pickles, um, this is the info you can get them at. And that's pretty much all I got. And if you see me around, uh, I'm pretty good talking one-on-one. -on -one. This is just a lot of people. And I really appreciated you guys doing that wave. That was pretty fucking awesome. So uh, thank you.